Aren't you glad for that? <laughs> it's good to see you this morning. Happy Mother's Day again. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, today I'm going to be sharing a message, just to, hopefully a real word of encouragement for our moms. But if you're not a mom, uh, the truth and the principles there will still apply, all right? So, uh, hey, how's everybody doing? <laughs> it's good to see you today. You know, we're doing family photos. Some of y'all actually took a bath on Saturday, and man, you're looking good, and you're smelling good, and it's good and glad that you're here to worship with us today. I want to share a message with you that I've entitled Mothers and the Master and Placing Your Kids in, in the Hands of Jesus. This is a, we're going to divert from our series that we're in on No Turning Back, and we'll come back to that next Sunday. But I really felt like I just wanted to share a word with moms today and encourage them. Praise God for the moms that love the Lord and love their families. But it's taken up, maybe as we look at it and start with it, you might think, well, that's kind of a, a strange place to start in Luke 7. In chapters 11 through 17 is, is a passage there where Jesus interrupts a funeral in the city of Nain. Well, I'll find it here in a minute. My little weather channel changer. But uh, let me tell you a story before I even get to the passage of scripture that you may have heard not too long ago about a, a name, uh, a young lady by the name of Ashley Bridges. She was 10 weeks pregnant when she went to the doctor having some problems where she was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, these doctors recommended that she immediately abort the baby and start chemotherapy uh, so as to, you know, forego the cancer and terminate the pregnancy, take care of the chemo. She looked at the doctor. She said, you know, there's just no way I can kill a healthy baby just because I'm sick. She told a uh, news reporter by the name of Christine Lazar of CBS, she's, uh, she said during her third trimester at eight months, uh, she was told that delaying that would allow the cancer to spread too much. She said that's basically when they told me that it was completely terminal. She said, I'm not going to abort the baby. She uh, was told she needed to deliver this child, by, she already named Paisley, immediately so she could start the treatments. Uh, even with the multiple rounds of chemo, she was given less than a year to live. She wouldn't terminate. She took as minimal amounts of chemo. Uh, so as not to affect the baby and said that you don't do something, you know, you're going to have to do it. They told her to deliver at eight months and she did. But at that point, they let her know it's, it's, it's terminal. She said, I felt like I tried so hard to keep Paisley safe and do the minimum treatment to keep her healthy. The thought that I'm not going to see her grow up, it's really hard. She has a sister also who commented on, on her words. Uh, and she said, you know, she's a real life superhero, to be honest with you. There's no one like her. Her six-year-old son, she already had one child. His exact words were, Mom, if you pass away, I want to come with you. Bridges said of Paisley, she said, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be here, and she is. Now, a lot of people in, in our world today don't understand that kind of thinking that she would not abort her child so as to protect her own life. And uh, she just said, I just can't, I can't see doing that. She did pass away, but you know, as I remember hearing that story, I thought, you know, what a tremendous sacrifice, what a tremendous picture, and just to get a little bit of grip on how a mother really loves a child, because I don't think that even the world understands, but many times when people talk about love, you know, they, they use the, the context of, of a mother's love. You've heard the terminology before, you know, he has a face only a mother could love. Uh, that was in reference to me, I think. But in Luke 17, there's a story about a mom, and, then, and it's about, you, you get a, a picture of a, a mom who doesn't seem that there's any hope for until Jesus gets on the scene. Soon afterwards, it says in Luke 17, verse 11, after, that's Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, and they were being accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd followed from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said, do not weep. And he came and he touched the coffin and the bears came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man set up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Verse 16, and fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God and saying a great prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people. And this report concerning him went out over all Judea and all the surrounding district. 
Now, again, this may seem like a, a strange bit of passage to share on Mother's Day, but I think there, there's something here we just need to get, a, get a, our heads and our hearts wrapped around, especially for moms. I believe it'll be a tremendous word of encouragement. But here's a mom who's going through a very difficult times in her life, obviously. Nobody wants to outlive their children. It just doesn't seem normal. Some of you have suffered the loss of a child in your life. And, you know, we always have this mindset that, you know, that we'll, we'll, we won't outlive our children. And it, 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 it's a heartbreaking scenario. But not only was that the situation, here she is, she's a widow. And she's marching through the city streets with her son's coffin in a ceremonial procession headed for the cemetery. You know, uh, this is a, a point in time where all hope is lost, it seems. A time when it doesn't look like there's anything that can be done. Now, your kids may be a living today and you kind of may feel that s a sense of that desperation in your own life. Maybe your children are very young and you're looking at the craziness of the culture around us. I mean, the world is upside down and backwards. And I mean, we're living in some very critical times and difficult times. I can't even think about trying to raise children as some of you are doing this generation that we're facing and you see the deterioration. But I think there's a lesson to learn here from this woman who has no other recourse to go and hasn't even sought Jesus, which we'll see is the glory about Jesus here. But God interrupts and intervenes in this situation and brings hope out of hopelessness. And the, the bottom line here is even as the sermon title said is placing your kids in the hands of Jesus, placing your family in the hands of Jesus. Let's look at how this story turns out. There's a simple, four simple points here. Point number one is, is the problem. In verse 11 and 12, it says, they came to pass that day. He went to the city and many of his disciples are with him. Remember, this is the early on of Jesus' ministry. Lots of crowds are attending him. So there are much people with him as well. You see that crowd coming to the city. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, there was a, a dead man being carried out. The only son of his mother, she was a widow and much people of the city were with her. Now, you talk about having your situation that's totally looks unresolvable. It's not that her, her son is alive and she's praying for him in some regard. Hey, but this issue is a, is a done issue as far as the world's concerned. This young man is lifeless. There's nothing to do here. They add to the tragedy that the grief that she's suffering, it's her only son. That's the way it reads. There's, there's no other children. This is her only son. And the next word says, and she was a widow. I mean, here's this, this woman who's facing severe isolation in her life, severe pain and sorrow and grief of the loss that she's experienced. We don't know how close these, these deaths were. We don't really know how much old the son was. Uh, obviously, he, 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 it's referred to as an older man, calling him uh, as a man in this regard. But catch, catch this, this scenario that Luke's giving us. Here comes Jesus. There's a large crowd with him. You can see them approaching the city. They're following Jesus. He's just come from healing the centurion's son, if you follow that story, who was very sick and here's a Gentile and Jesus shows mercy and compassion and he heals that, that, that young man. And now they're on their way through the Galilee in this ministry tour, the next city's the, the city of, of Nain and they come into town and there's a funeral going on. So they're coming in, the others are coming out and it's a large procession. I mean, you, you look at the picture he paints, there's a crowd of mourners. First of all would be the mom, all right? In sorrow and deep grief. Next would, behind her would be the casket, you know, and behind the casket would be family and other family relations and friends. And behind them would be, it was customary for the city to come out and mourn, you know, the, the, the people. So the, there's a large group of people making their way to the cemetery. The coffin is open as it was in those days until the actual burial took place. And so they're pr proceeding through the city here. All right. All this is taking place. Here's Jesus comes in with his followers, obviously the 12 and many more with him. And there's kind of this, all of a sudden, these two crowds meet in the way. All right. That's, that's, the, there's the picture. But here's the other picture within that picture of, of this particular problem. Here's a lady in deep sorrow over her son. And there's nothing can be done about it. There's nothing, but he, he's, he's gone. It seems absolutely hopeless. But he, look what happens. Jesus shows up and obviously when things are absolutely hopeless, there's always hope when Jesus is on the scene. Look at his compassion and look at the pity that he demonstrates. And it says, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, don't cry. Well, that sounds like a stupid thing to say at a funeral, right? Don't, don't weep anymore. 
but he knew some things that she didn't know. And that's a point that you should, you should try to remember. There are things that God sees, God knows that you don't know. You don't have all the information. You don't have all the knowledge. You don't have all the insight, but he does especially moms. It's so easy for moms to, to get worried and, you know, so stressed out about things that are going on with their children and with their sons and their daughters. But understand it, the Lord knows everything that's going on. Nothing that's going on in your life has escaped his attention. He is the omniscient God. He sees all things. I believe that Jesus knew exactly when he got to name what was going to happen. I believe he went there with that purpose because what did it say in scripture? We've understood about Jesus is, he says in John 15 and also in John five, I do those things which my father tells me. The miracles you see me perform, I only do them in response to what the father has told me to do. He said, the son only speaks what the father tells him to say. The son only does what the father, does. so, you know, he's not act, acting independently. He's, he has a mission and he's going there with that mission in mind. But also understand this, this woman, this widow, we don't even get her name, all right? He knew her name, but he also knows your name. He also knows your life. He knows your background. He knows your upbringing. He knows you. He knows your spouse. He knows your kids. He knows all these things. And he's showing compassion, all right? He's showing mercy. She didn't know him. You can be sure that he knew exactly who she was. She may not even heard of him yet. She may not have heard about his miracles. And now it seems like kind of a strange situation for Jesus to manifest those things. You may be experiencing in your life right now some very devastating moments in your life. But please, as well as you know those moments and you're familiar with what's happening in your life, he knows more about what's going on in your life than what you do. And I think sometimes we forget that. Like we think that in prayer, prayer is the time I have to tell God about everything happening. All right, I got to inform him. By the way, pay attention. <laughs> we got issues here. We got problems here. And I think I need to remind you. He doesn't need reminders. So, but it's looking hopeless. Well, how about this situation? Not just looking hopeless, it's hopeless, right? Well, there, there's no hope here. But you see the Lord, and, and praise God for this, because we can be awfully blind and short-sighted, can't we? But the Lord still moves beyond that and loves us and shows his mercy and shows his compassion and moves into this situation. And he demonstrates, what we call it our third point, he demonstrates his power. And it came and he touched the coffin and the bears came, the pallbearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And that dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus turned him back over to his mother. Again, here's the two crowds coming down the street. It's, a, it's almost like they're getting ready to pass and Jesus is at the lead of this one and here's this mom at the lead of this one and he looks at her and he says, don't weep. He walks right over to the coffin and puts his hand on that young man. He says, get up. Now, for a moment, this, this millisecond of time, you know, I'm sure there's somebody in the crowd who's thinking, what is going on? Who is that guy? Somebody call security, you know? <laughs> I mean, what's happening here? This, you, don't, you don't tell women to stop crying. They've just lost their son. Somebody needs to, you know, so you can understand that the scene is a little bit strange and a little bit bizarre, but I, I want to point that out because it may seem strange and bizarre, but Jesus can interrupt anything at any time when he chooses to do so. And by the way, he always interrupts it at the right time. I don't think Mary and Martha understood that when Lazarus died. Well, if you had been here, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and life. I don't have to be here for this. Yeah. I, I caused the dead to be raised. I mean, look, I mean, can you imagine the reaction of the pallbearers, the mourners, the mom, uh, you know, or the man who was dead? That sure interrupted his deal. <laughs> can you imagine what was the fear, the, the amazement, the confusion? Most of all, here we are, the, 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 what was a funeral is now turned into a celebration now becomes a party, but this is what happens. And you have to remember this. It may be dark in this moment, all right? But you have to remember when Jesus finally arrives on the scene, he's there already, but when we see him on the scene and when he shows up, 
You know, there's a demonstration that only he can do. There's a power that's manifest that only he can manifest, you know. And anybody that's walked with Jesus for any length of time has somehow witnessed this power demonstrated in some regard in their life or in their family or in their friends. What this shows, this young man, he's dead. And this gift of Jesus, it shows this. Nothing's really impossible. I mean, you may be looking at a situation in your own family today and saying, I just don't know. I don't know if this is going to work out. This, there can't be any good in this. This, this, can't, this can't be right. I don't know. It's just not going to work out. Hey, nothing is impossible. Nothing. And this certainly points out the fact. But I want you to notice that Jesus is not randomly doing around but walking around doing miracles, right, right the way, all right? There is definition and there is purpose to everything that Jesus does. You say, well, what's the purpose? Well, it's revealed here in verses 16 and 17. It says, fear gripped them all and they began to glorify God saying, a great prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people. This report concerning him went out all over Judea and all the surrounding district. Ultimate purpose is the glory of God. Their ultimate purpose is that Christ is glorified, that the Father is glorified, and that witness is being born of the glory of God into all corners that it can reach. The people there who witnessed that saw a genuine miracle. And it was a miracle that set them into basically a, a spontaneous reaction. First of all, of, of intrepidation. And the word fear here is not that they're afraid of Jesus. Man, it means they're showing tremendous regard and tremendous respect. And they're giving him the platform that he deserves, so to say. In other words, you're in charge. And it says, then they began to glorify God. But listen, listen carefully. And this is so important in regards to moms and children and even dads and their children and their grandchildren. This is, this is, this is the point of it here. The point is to bring glory to God. The point of your children ultimately is to bring glory to God. The point of your life is to bring glory to God. And you know, there's one thing that, and I've shared this letter, I'm gonna share some portions of it again, that my mom sent me uh, about a month before I gave my life to Christ. And I was messed up kid like so many kids are today, and followed the popularity route and the music route and the, and, and the drug route and the party route. More than anything else, it was just, you know, I, I thought I was the Ayatollah partyola, you know, I just, just, that's what was important. I was just gonna, that was all fun, having fun. You know, that's party. That's the culture today, things haven't changed. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. You, you can find that all the way back to Genesis chapter two when the devil says, hey, let's have a party, eat that tree. You know, that's gonna be fun. You know, you're going to see something you ain't seen before. And, and so that, were, that was my life, you know, from, from high school on. And, and it, what happens, the party gets old after a while. Some of you are still trying to go to the party and it's old. You know, there's no fun in it anymore. There's no life there. In fact, you begin to discover that all the other party goers are partying just because they're as miserable as you are. Right? And they're not happy. And so to be happy, you know, we have to, we have to party and we have to, we have to drink something or smoke something or snort something or take something, some kind of additive to our life. And it's so temporary. That's why, you know, the party ends and you, you're miserable for a day or two. You got to go to another party. In fact, I, you know, parties were so important to me. I started partying. I didn't wait till Friday or Saturday party. I started partying on Thursdays. That's when my week, it was officially in my mind, the weekend begins on Thursday. Why? Because I didn't want to go another day miserable. I just wanted to, you know, anesthetize myself, deaden it. And so that was my life. And my mom saw that. Now, I was so wrapped up with myself at the time. I, didn't, I really didn't care. About, I'm not hurting anybody. It was my mindset. And that's what most people, I'm not hurting anybody. And you don't realize how many people you are hurting. You don't realize how many lives you're affecting by your rebellion or whatever it is in your life where you're just resistant and self-centered. That, that, was, that was the heart of my life. And it, it went on like that as my mom began to pray for me. And it became real obvious in my high school years the direction I was heading. Then after leaving home, my mom used to send me these letters. I, I left home at the ripe old age, just, just turned 18. Got out, of, got out of Dallas quickly. Well, it wasn't Dallas, but you know, it was home. Because I wanted, I wanted no one telling me what to do. Anybody been there? Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. She wrote me a letter. Now, it wasn't uncommon for her to write a letter. What was uncommon was is it was such a little letter. All right. She wrote books. She was a prophetess, so she had to write Bibles. You know, 
she, she'd just fill them with scripture and memory verses and all kinds of stuff, you know, quote for the day, all that kind of stuff. It'd usually be four or five pages, typewritten back and forward, stuffed in a big fat envelope, always had to have extra stamps, you know, to get where it was going. I would kind of squeeze through it and see, did anybody die? You know, is there any money? Nowhere. Is, is, is there anything I need to know about this pertinent information? I didn't think all that Bible stuff was pertinent. So I'd throw those away. But this was shocked me because it came in a small envelope and I, I, I had it printed out because uh, uh, I've held on this letter so long, I kind of keep it in case now in a special place. So I, I typed it out myself one day uh, because uh, the biggest miracle is that, I, is that I kept it when all the others were thrown away. But when it was written, I put it in big bold font for my old blind eyes to read, you know. But in reality, it'd be about that much of a page, you know, in those little low typewriters. Isn't that what they used to call them? <laughs> it says this, shocking. First of all, she's been praying. Second of all, I'm becoming more miserable. I'm saying that all the party life is, is, is dysfunctional. It, you know, it's not offering me any satisfaction. It's getting old, you know, and then you experience the heartbreaks of life and all those things. She writes this letter, Joseph, which she always called me. She used the whole name when I was in trouble. You were born for one purpose and one purpose only as every soul that has ever been sent into the human race has been. And that one reason is to glorify God, the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Now that's the essence of the passage I'm reading. Jesus is on the scene to be glorified. She said, let me ask you this. She asked it and then she answers it by the way. It's like my mother. Let me ask you, are you? If not, why not? What hinders you? Sin? She answered that too. Right? Right. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph, how long will you halt between two opinions, right and wrong? I mean, there's a lot, some of you have children in the same scenario today. Some of you have grandkids in the same scenario today. Kind of stuck in the middle of the road. Here's right, here's wrong. I don't want to go right because it offends the way I'm living my life over here. So I kind of ignore the right and I'll pay a little heed and attention to it occasionally to right, but I really don't want to get right. So I'll acknowledge right. And if I acknowledge right, then that certainly must make me right on some level. No, you can't have both. Jesus said, there's just two roads. There's not three. There's not a, there's not a, a road down the middle of the two. It's right or wrong. It, it, it's, it's highway to hell or the, the byway to heaven. Which, which is it going to be? You have to make that choice. And that's what she's saying in the letter. She says, you can't serve God and the devil. It's just not going to work. But here was the part that caught me. She says, also, you can't stop sinning just because you want to. Well, excuse me. I certainly could. I've done it a million times. I've quit smoking at least 30 times during this part. By the time I read this letter. You got the, you understand. I, I quit smoking dope. I, I did it for a, a day. I quit taking that. I quit snorting that. I did that for, for, for a few days. No, I hadn't quit anything yet, had I? I just kind of put a hold on it. She says, you have to come to Jesus just the way you are, and then you'll have him in your heart to do the stopping for you. She goes on and talks about the relationships. I realize that you're in a struggle in your spiritual life, but you know the truth. You know the difference between right and wrong. And I realize that you're being pulled by the world, by your flesh and by the devil. But in the final analysis, you know, you got to face God one day. He says, and when you do, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Every man answers to God for himself. And when he stands before him at the last day, which could be any day, you're not be able to blame anybody or anything except yourself. He says, understand eternity is very certain. Judgment's very sure. And it's coming and it's closer today than it was yesterday. You say, your mom wrote you that? She's tough. But I was hard headed. Don't you say it was. Is it's just you know? She said, "Just be sure it's coming," and God is the only one who has much time you have left. And that was an appropriate statement because of the stupid stuff I was doing. Every day was near death. You know, what are you going to do? And here's what comes, and this is what made me think of this letter when I thought of this situation and this woman with this hopelessness in her life, and what the purpose for this miracle was. We talk about purpose is what she wrote in the next part of this letter. She says, "Listen." 
And I, in, unless you're a mom, you probably don't, or even a parent, you don't understand the depth and the sacrifice which is being mentioned here. She says this, I love you better than my own life. And I've come to the place that I can pray like this. Lord, you know, I'm not praying for any personal advantage, nor to avoid hardship, nor that my own will in any way would be done, but only for this, that you might be glorified. Now, see, what happens so often when we, we face situations of, of despair and, and circumstances in our life that bring us to a place of a burden and to a, a place of desperation before God and we're praying. Many times we're not really praying that you be glorified. Many times we're praying, Lord, take away the problem. Lord, I'm tired of the pain. This hurts. I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Fix this or fix that. It's, you know, and, and in Jesus name. Amen. But I think the real key to having our prayers answered is when we can selflessly approach the throne of God and say, Lord, I'm just praying you be glorified. Whatever that means. I'm taking my hands completely off of it and placing your hands completely on it. That's when we get to the point where we say, may you be glorified. Don't know how this is going to turn out. Don't know how this is going to work. I don't know what's going to happen here. But listen, I'm trusting you, Lord. Remember Jesus in the model prayer in Matthew when he says, here's how you pray. And that part says, don't lead us in temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, thine is the glory forever. Amen. Now, great things happened that day in that city. But I want you to know, great things are still happening. God, God is still moving. God is still doing things. I stand here today as a pastor of a church. Now, that may not seem odd to you. That's laughable for me. I mean, laughable. I hated preachers. All right, now I are one. That's miraculous. You know, that's supernatural. Amen. I mean, you may not see it, but it is. But that's the power of God. You don't think your child has any way in the world of ever changing or ever being. Done. Hey, listen, God's bigger than all that. God's bigger. And every time that prayers were going up, God was moving and I was getting worse, you know? And I thought, man, I keep praying, things just keep getting worse. Hey, that means the stage is being set. Something's getting ready to happen that only God's gonna get the glory for. Not you, not your intelligence, not your smart, not your savvy, not your ability to, 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 to somehow calculate and make things, somehow. no, God's gonna be glorified. No one's gonna be able to say, well, he did that or she did that. No, God did that. I mean, that was certainly the picture of this dead kid, wasn't it? God did that. So no matter what it is you're facing, I mean, some of you have children who are struggling with addictions. Some of you have kids that are struggling with alcoholism. Some of you have kids that are suffering depression and illnesses. Some of you have children in jail or in prison. Some of you are dealing with divorces and custodies and custody battles. Some, some are having children. I mean, your children are living rebellious lives. Some of you are facing a culture which you know, man, I, my kid's just a, a, a baby now, but I know in this, this, this world we live, it's going to be difficult. I mean, we got children now involved in gender confusion and homosexuality. Others that are facing different kinds of issues, maybe health issues and mental issues. Some are just living in abject rebellion and just rejecting everything God has. Some are just really far away from God. And that list goes on and on because there's so many different situations that our kids are facing and our families are facing. But I want you to know this. I know as a loving parent, you're concerned for them. And I know today that there's some of you that are carrying some very heavy burdens and you're holding some difficult things in your hands. And you may feel like this woman, there's nothing I can do. That's okay to be at that place, but realize don't stop there. There's everything that can be done. You have to comprehend the fact that Jesus just as he knew her name, he knows your name. Just as he knew her loss, not only her husband, but he knew her loss. And just as he understands her fears and her doubts, and he calmed those, he said, don't weep anymore. God, God can speak those things to your heart. God's no respecter of his children. In other words, he loves us all equally. He has compassion on us equally. He cares for you. You come to the place where you trust him. And in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his place and in his moment, don't become fearful and hopeless. That's, that's the enemy of your faith. Faith moves the mountains, but hopelessness just digs a grave. So you move forward. What Jesus did in Nain that day, 
He can certainly do something glorious in your life or in your family or in your home. But I know for sure he can remove your desperation and he can give you hope. And I know he can change hearts and lives today. So I got, I got, some, I got some issues with my kids, Pastor. Hey, place them in the hands of Jesus. Just take them to the altar and say, Lord, I'm not praying for any person. I just want you to be glorified in their life. And keep them there. And you'll see the change of God and the work of God. For me, I did a lot of running. I, I, and the more miserable I got, the more you think, the more miserable I got, I just turn around and realize this is hopeless. And get right, no. Because we like to add misery to our misery, right? You know, I'd do something stupid, feel bad about it, and go do it again. All right? It's that cycle of stupidity we get caught in. And if you're that kid here today, it's time to grow up. All right? It's, it's time to realize that the world's not all about you. And you're not the sun in the middle of the universe. All right? The, 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 everything doesn't spin and turn on you. But your life. There are people who love you. And there are people you are hurting people you're wounding and the people you know you love, those are the same ones you're wounding. Choices. I remember just to get to that point, I just did, I tried to do better, couldn't do better. And that's when that letter came after that, you know, you're gonna have to have God in your life. Because until you really get serious about putting God in control of your life, nothing's gonna change. Nothing's gonna change. Praise God. He's not dead. He's on the throne and he's still moving in the world today. Let's give him the opportunity. Let our life become the platform on which he does something. Let him be the one who speaks into your heart and says, don't weep. Don't weep. Because he's about to speak to somebody else or something else. Just as he spoke to that son after that. I'm going to ask, don't have the band come forward this morning. Just, you can remain seated. But I'm going to ask all our moms just to stand where you are. And I want to have a word of prayer for all our moms. If you're here with your mom, count that as a great blessing. In fact, why don't you just reach over while I pray for your mom. Just put your hand on her, all right? If you can reach her there, reach over to her. And as I pray for her, I'd ask, ask you to pray for her as well. I know this is a day that we've, federal calendars have marked as Mother's Day, but I do think there ought to be a time where we give special attention to these women who've given so much, sacrificed so much, spent themselves so much and committed themselves so much. Father, I want to thank you personally for the mom you gave me. Oh, she sits in your presence today. I thank you for the blessing, the message of her life and the ministry of faith that she had for her children. Father, for these moms, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to their hearts today. Especially those who are burdened in carrying something, Lord, that's a very heavy load. That today they would cast their cares upon you because you care for them. And today they would realize that no matter what things look on the outside, if they're trusting you, they have great hope. If they're believing you, they don't have to look at the things that are. They can believe you for the days to come. That you're going to be glorified in mighty ways. I ask you to touch these women, Father. Let your grace pour over their lives today in a very special way. May they know more than anything else as they leave this facility today that you care about them, you love them, you're committed to them, you're on their side. Draw them to yourself. Let them know your nearness today. May you be continue as our, all our purpose is to be glorified in them. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.